Hello, everybody. Welcome to SHI Stadium, uh, home of the Rutgers Scarlet Knights, who were just defeated 56 to 21 by the number two Ohio State Buckeyes. This is Rapid Reaction, brought to you by Byers Auto and Berm. I just, I don't know what to say about this game. It's, it was really bizarre, and it was like I had a couple Ohio State staffers uh, behind the scenes people come up, and they're like, "We just had to get through this one yeah. and get out of here as quick as possible." And it's like, it's hard to say that a 35 point win is ever unimpressive, uh, or you know, boring, or I don't even, I, I'm struggling to think of the right way to describe yeah. it because it was like, it just was a game that happened. Ohio State could have named its score today and they decided not to. I think that's the first thing, if you think about that first six minutes of the game, this game could have been, I was on the field of course and shooting the photos and one of the Ohio State camera guys was like, well, I'm, at this pace, it's gonna be 84 to nothing at the end of the first half. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, 21 points in seven minutes. They just, uh, they really could have put on a, a serious number today. Um, and I, I can't help but think that what they saw happen in the Alabama game played some part in their mind of saying, let's just dial it back. You don't ever want to, to be sloppy, but I think that there was just an obvious moment of, hey, this game is over. Let's just get the heck out of here. And, um, you know, Rutgers, to their credit, scored more points against Ohio State than anybody in the country this season <laughs> other than um, Florida Atlantic who scored the same number and two games now this year Ohio State hasn't covered the spread and it was Florida Atlantic and Rutgers uh, it is a weird game I, I think but it's I think it's one reason that you can look at it and say well you know the, the common reaction is well that's not going to work against Penn State well you already seen that Ohio State can flip it on when it right. needs to. And this was just not a game that was going to move the needle for them. And Ford Atlantic wasn't either, even though it was a season opener. So it's kind of funny, but I think you use those both as the same example. Like, that's not what Ohio State is like at their best. Yeah. And they didn't. They knew that they didn't need that. And when you're already talking about, should you take Justin Fields out in the second quarter, or you debate at halftime, do you let him play into the third for one drive, which they did tonight? It's like, well, you're going to have a hard time keeping the attention of your team. Yeah, I think that that's one thing that I saw today. Like, they're up 21 nothing, and then Rutgers punts. And I swear, from where I was standing, you could see Garrett Wilson on that punt that he fumbled. And the kid had a lane to the end zone. And I swear he just saw it and was like, I'm going to run up and catch this punt and return it for a touchdown. And then he fumbled, and then you just go, ah, crap. And then a little bit of the energy goes out of the stadium. This place was an absolute morgue. Uh, by by the time the second half started, and even as we were talking about before we went on the camera here, but like the Buckeyes on the sideline didn't seem to have any sort of energy for the backups when they were in the game. It was just a matter of let's just get this out of the way, and then you had the backups with penalties and blah blah blah. It just was sort of ugly. And they have been that way. I think mostly like the Northwestern game, that sideline was raucous. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think they knew what was coming. With they were excited for Wisconsin and all that, but they were cheering and pulling for Dewan Jones and. Marcus Crowley late in that Northwestern game, and I'm not saying that they weren't feeling good for their, their guys that were getting playing time in the second half, but at some point, you look, there's no one in the stadium today except yeah. Ohio State fans. There's approximately 10 fewer people here than there were in the third quarter right now. so you right don't now. have that juice. You're not feeling like it's a Big Ten game. You've now been in 10 consecutive blowouts. Like At some point, even if you are a national championship mentality mindset of every game being important, and Jordan Fuller called it a March Madness approach, at some point, there is going to be a game where you get a little bored. And if this is the worst Ohio State no. could play and you win by 35 on the road in the Big Ten, Ryan Day has to be feeling pretty good inside knowing that Penn State and the game are looming after this. Yeah, I mean, this is the one time this year that I've looked and seen an Ohio State team that didn't seem entirely focused. And I mentioned it to somebody at halftime that, you know, if this was a game that was being played at Illinois or someplace right now, that a team that's actually playing okay football, I would have been concerned about this game just from a standpoint of, of saying, you know, they know what's coming. They've had a huge games. They're all this national talk. And then you have Penn State and Michigan. And then you think to yourself, well, maybe there's a moment for a letdown. And this was a letdown, yeah. an emotional letdown for Ohio State. It was obviously, again, the first eight minutes of the game showed if they were really trying to, to do whatever they wanted today, they could have. But it was pretty clear that their interest was to get in here and get out of here. Yeah, it's weird. You have to just put the stock. Like, if you don't have that fumble uh, from Garrett Wilson on special teams, right. which leads to one little bit of defensive breakdown, not sure exactly if it was Pete Warner or Tough Borland that you would maybe assign the blame. doesn't really matter. But up until that point, you had Sean Wade forcing two turnovers. You had Justin Fields. He winds up with his first 300-yard passing performance, four touchdowns. J.K. Dobbins is doing whatever he wants. They got him protected nice and early. Tells you how important they believe yeah. that guy will be to this stretch run. 
uh, competing for championships. So you look at that and it's like, okay, well, there's the number two team in the country, the team that I think is the most complete team in the country. They've already accomplished their mission. And now what do you do from here? Yeah, you go out of here, you get home and you turn the focus to Penn State, which is what Ryan Day and the football players we talked to after the game tonight said that they were doing. They said they brought up Penn State in the locker room. They, that is the focus now, and that is our focus now. So I, I think that we can successfully put this one to bed and move on to Penn State. Okay, rapid reaction brought to you by Byers Auto. What did you think of the field's passing performance? I asked Day about this in the post game, and I think they're starting to see him do more things. Two really nice deep throws yeah. to Chris Olave. One required a crazy catch. It was pass interference. I don't have any idea how Chris Olave caught that football, but the one earlier on, the, the 60 yarder, or so 58 yeah, no. yarder. Uh, those two guys are going. They have tremendous chemistry. But I teed it up. What did you think of the way Fields threw the football? I thought it was ridiculous that there was any called plays where Justin Fields was running the football tonight <laughs> because, number one, he looked very comfortable in the passing game. The offensive line was giving him great protection, great time. This was not a game where there was any sort of real pass rush to be concerned about. Um, you know, he, he was on the money. He was accurate. And I think that that's what you should come to expect out of Justin Fields because that's what he's done all year long. He's completing almost 70% of his passes. He's a guy that clearly is developing still as a, as a passer, especially down the field. You know, the one down here to, to Olave in the first half, I think that he might have been able to lead him with a, a couple yards and score on that sure. play. But you got the, the real key to being a good quarterback, especially when your team is superior, is make sure your guy can catch the football. And when you have guys like Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson and Benjamin Victor, you just give them a chance to catch the football. Benjamin Victor's first touchdown today is a perfect example of that. That's not a play that you just, you you lose. You don't lose on that play one way or the other, right? You're throwing it and you're either gonna put it out of bounds or Victor's gonna make a great catch and you're gonna put it right on the money. And that's what Justin Fields did and that's what he's, he's been doing. And um, Ohio State fans should be sending extra like Christmas cards down to Athens, Georgia <laughs> at some point. Hey, you look at this too, uh, Sean Wade was a guy who was out here on the field and he was, a lot of people were talking about, well, Chase Young is coming back next week. That is obviously a huge deal for the Buckeyes. He's the best player in college football. He's going to be back on your team. That's obviously going to help. But he didn't just name Chase Young. He said, we're excited to get Jonathan Cooper back. We're excited to get Baron Browning back. We're excited to get Austin Mack back. And again, there's a week to go before that can ha happen and we don't know. Uh, some of those seem like they might be with Coop uh, still dealing with that nagging high ankle sprain, significant, and, and we'll see if he's on the availability report next week or not. But they also kept Damon Arnett. He traveled. He went through all the warm-ups. He still, it's the same deal with the cast on his hand. It's crazy. He held him out. Like, those three guys, Arnett, Mack, and Cooper, have had the same injuries that they started fall camp with. Uh, Austin with the hamstring and Jonathan, as you mentioned, with the ankle issue and, and Arnett with the hand, but they just keep plugging along. And I think that's one thing that I constantly am, am amazed at is that we've st still not seen this Ohio State team anywhere close to full strength on defense this season because every week they're rotating one or two defensive ends out of the rotation uh, as, as it be for injury issues. And it's it's pretty crazy. I don't know if Jonathan Cooper is going to be back next week. I'm, I I would suggest that he probably won't be, but I think that obviously the impact of Chase Young, and not just what he does for the defense, but what the energy he brings uh, to the whole team is going to be a game changer when the Buckeyes and Penn State tee it up uh, at noon next Saturday. All right, what was the most interesting thing you saw before we get out of here? I mean, it's gonna be, but uh, maybe not interesting to everybody. It's interesting to me. It was interesting that Cade Stover has been ah, moved to defensive you end. Mine, I didn't mean to tee it up. Like uh, that Cade Stover. Should have just said it. Cade Stover is a four-star linebacker, freshman. Uh, clearly, walking through today the pra the pregame, he was working with the defensive lineman. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. And then he comes out here and plays defensive end. And this is the fourth game of the year for him. So they this is. Now a moment where they have to decide if he's going to redshirt, which I assume he will. So you don't expect him to play in the next couple of weeks. No. Um, but it's so important that Cade got an opportunity to play a game as a defensive end this season before he begins to really change uh, his approach. And, and he mentioned it. We were walking down the tunnel, and he said that he's there for good. And I think that's really interesting for Ohio State. If you're a recruiting fan, then that's something to pay attention to because they have been sort of concerned that they can't find another defensive end in this class of 2020 that they really want. And now you have one that's uh, designed for that. And Cade Stover, if you're not really familiar with him, six foot five, 235, 240 pound kid, 
very similar to like Sam Hubbard in the way that he can develop athletically, former uh, All-State basketball player, a kid that I mean, didn't play dodgeball, but he was still pretty damn good uh, on the hardwood. Didn't play that either, but okay. uh, he's a guy that I think really uh, is interesting, and I, I'm glad that they found a way to move him because what it means is that what they see out of Kayvon Pope and Taraja Mitchell and Dallas Gant and all these other linebackers is, hey, we got to find ways to get all these guys out of the field at once. Why did you have to steal my anecdote in the tunnel there? Like, I don't know. What's yours? What? Okay. Well, because I walked up to him and his bag says, Cade Stover, linebacker, so you're going to have to give you a new bag. But it's interesting. You said, you know, you noticed that during pregame, on Wednesday night, I think we're leaving the practice facility, and in comes Jonathan Cooper and Cade Stover, the last two guys to leave the field. And this had happened the week before as well, where Cooper had been working with Baron Browning, who then we saw uh, that before he got right. pulled from that game, you know, he was out there at defensive end. Both of those guys are sort of been potential solutions that wouldn't just be for this year. I mean, Baron Browning is a great linebacker, but he can move back and forth. Right. Cade Stover, I think is transitioning and it's also an example of yeah. what we've talked about Jonathan Cooper continuing to help this team even when he can't play. Cade's body is going to get to 265, 270 pounds very naturally. I mean he's a kid that was trying to keep his weight down as a senior in high school and was up to 240 uh, and when he got here they cut him down a little bit to like 225 but his body is designed to be 6'5", 270 uh, and so he's really a player that I think will be fun to watch over the next couple of years for Buckeye fans because like if you are building a football player and you like want, like, this is the guy that you want off the bus, it, it's Kate Silver because he has the look of I'm pissed off all the time and I love it. All right, he was one of those guys who got a lot of playing time in another blowout for Ohio State, 56-21 over Rutgers. Business is about to really pick up. Letterman Rose is going to have all the coverage you could possibly need over the next six days getting ready for Penn State, a top 10 showdown. Uh, it's going to be East Division Championship is going to be on the line. Can't wait for this. Uh, the real games and championship season is finally here. He's Jeremy Birmingham. I'm Austin Ward. This has been Rapid Reaction brought to you by Buyers Auto. We will see you back in Columbus. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live, we've got the practice report, we got Rapid Reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.